Uh, your name, background, a little bit about yourself. Okay, my, my name is Llewellyn Vaughan Lee. I was born in England in 1953. I had a sort of English middle class upbringing and then when I was 19 I met a Sufi teacher called Irina Tweedy who had uh, studied in India under a Sufi master. And I stayed with her for many, many, many years. And then in 12 years ago, I was sent to America to make a Sufi center in California and have continued her work of this particular Sufi tradition, which is known as the Naqshbandi Sufi tradition. We're known as the silent Sufis because we practice a silent meditation. And our tradition goes back to the 13th, 14th century in the Middle East. How's that? Good. Yeah. Volume good. Everything's great. All right. Describe what happens to a person after they die. <laughs> Describe what happens to a person after they die. It depends on the evolution of the soul. Um, most peoples, they have these near-death experiences. They go through a tunnel of light. They go through a tunnel and they meet a, a bright light at the end of the tunnel. That bright light is actually their higher self or the soul, which people reconnect with after they die, after you leave the physical body. After you leave the physical body. In our, in our Sufi practice, we aspire to die before we die, to reconnect with that bright light, that uh, the higher self, while we're still in the physical body. And that's one of the central aspects of our spiritual practice, which, as I say, is encapsulated by the, the phrase, to die before you die. Why is there suffering and poverty in the world? Why is there suffering and poverty in the world? That's one of those big unanswerable questions. Because human beings are ignorant, because they have forgotten their divine nature, because they don't help each other, because they fight against each other. There are many, many reasons why human beings have to suffer. From a spiritual point of view, you see, and maybe I should explain that if you look at things from a spiritual point of view, it's quite different to if you look at it from a worldly point of view. And if you look at it from a spiritual point of view, Anyone who has begun the spiritual journey knows that suffering is a process of purification where we clean out the, the debris that we have accumulated inside of us, the denseness, the, the darkness within the psyche. And that suffering, that purification, the, the Sufis call it polishing the mirror of the heart until one day the mirror is so polished that it reflects the divine light of God through the heart into the world and that is part of our spiritual practice and I firmly believe there is enough to go around in the world I believe in, in in oneness and if you believe in oneness there must be enough for everybody why do some people have more than others because people are greedy because they want more than what belongs to them because we haven't yet evolved as a culture into this new perspective this new understanding of oneness which as far as I understand is the next step of he human evolution and there is we have the technology and to give everybody what they need there is enough food in the world for everybody but it needs a transition beyond a certain grasping greed and uh, desire for power to take this step into a global unity in which there will be enough for everybody and a whole level of suffering will cease to exist for humanity What would happen if everyone in the world truly learned to love their enemies? I don't think it's possible. Because in this world of duality, nothing is perfect, nothing is pure. It is part of our dynamic of life. Jung, Carl Jung, the great philosopher, psychologist, he said somewhere, you should never take somebody's problems away from them because it's through their problems that they grow. It is through this friction of light and dark that we grow. It would be a totally different species if we all loved each other because the conflicts of life are part of our evolution. It is, you grow through the conflicts with your parents, you, you discover yourself. And yes, there is a level of evolution where you realize the love that is everywhere. This is one of the basic mystical experiences that many, many people on the path have. And you see that everything is made of love. 
there is nothing other than love. And then, once you have reached that level, you do love everybody because, as a Sufi says, wheresoever you turn, there is the face of God. And when I look at you, I don't just see you, I also see the divine. I see the divine that is in you just as it is in me. And then I can't help but love you. But that is a, a, a long way for most people to travel. And so most people are caught in this dynamic of conflict, of light and dark, which is part of the fabric of their life. If we lived in a perfect world, it wouldn't be here, but in perfection there is no evolution, because everything just is. Why are so many people depressed? Why are so Because they have forgotten God. Very, very simple. We live in a culture of forgetfulness. I do a lot of meditation. I've been meditating for since I was 16 for 35 years, 34 years. And you can see inwardly because this physical world is not the only world there is. And once you do much meditation you begin to see somewhere else. You begin to see what the Sufis call or what is known as the inner planes, what is beyond the physical. There are many different planes of creation. And if you look in the inner world how, if you see how our culture looks in the inner world, you see this dark cloud of forgetfulness that covers the world. There is also, the desecration is also phenomenal. We have desecrated almost everything we regard as sacred. We, we have destroyed it. And so we have cut ourselves off from the source which nourishes us. If you don't have physical food, your body starves. If you don't have spiritual food, your soul starves. And if the soul starves, the meaning goes out of life. And if the meaning goes out of life, you get, you get depressed. And we have forgotten. To me, one of the great tragedies is not just that we have forgotten as a culture. We have, for example, forgotten that the world belongs to God. That is the most basic, fundamental reality that exists. The world belongs to God. We have not only forgotten the world belongs to God, we have forgotten that we have forgotten. It is such a dim, distant memory of a time when everything was sacred. It isn't actually, historically, it's not so long ago. Two or three thousand years ago, everything was sacred. Now what is sacred? Hardly anything. And so of course we are depressed, because we are deprived of that which gives meaning and joy to life. It is very, very simple. You see, my teacher, she said, mystics teach simple things but those simple things change people's lives. Why? Because God is a simple essence. The more you go on in meditation, the more you go on in your spiritual practice, you go back to the essence, you go back to the simplicity of what is. And these fundamental realities of life are very, very simple. It's not complex. It's not easy, but it's very simple. Describe God. Where can God be found? Describe God, you can't. It is a ludicrous question. It is because no one knows God but God. Us, with our limited mind capacity, with our limited, we can't, cannot know God. God is, the Sufis say, God is beyond even our idea of the beyond. And where can God be found? God can be found everywhere because one should never limit God. It is in every breath you breathe. That is why, for example, so many spiritual practitioners do a mantra, or for the Sufis we say a zikr, which is done with the breath. Because with the breath you remember the divine that is present throughout everything. And in many spiritual practices it is easiest to find God in the heart. This has to do with the psychic center, the chak heart chakra, which is where the divine and also the higher self, because for most human beings the higher self and the divine are synonymous. It is our nearest experience people have to the divine. And the higher self is most accessible in the heart. There is, according to the Sufis, there is in the heart an innermost chamber of the heart that belongs only to God. And if you go there in meditation and prayer, you are with God. It is a place of oneness. There the lover and the beloved are one. But God can be found everywhere. There is a lovely practice by Brother Lawrence, the, the practice of the presence of God. He was a monk in, I think, the 16th century. And whatever he did, he did with God. 
He worked in the kitchens. He hated working in the kitchens. But whatever he did, he did with God. He peeled the potatoes with God. He washed the carrots with God. God is everywhere. What is the relationship between science and religion? Science and religion will become one. It is part of the next stage of human evolution. It has to do with the speeding up of the planet. It's actually very exact. It has to do with a question of speed. Spiritual things are a question of speed. The more spiritual, the quicker the vibration. And if you look at the life around us, why is it speeding up so much? What is the underlying reason? Because as a mystic, you always look to the underlying reason. What is the underlying reason for our life speeding up to such a degree? It is so it can get near to the spiritual vibrations, so that the spiritual and every day become one. And part of the science of the future will be to understand how the spiritual and physical interrelate. What are the world's two biggest evils? What are the world's two biggest evils? Greed and the desire for power. The greed you can see, it is very interesting again in meditation, you see how greed corrupts all the values of our Western culture and our Western culture is spreading throughout the world. And the desire for power is very, very dangerous because now we have the ability through power to destroy the world. And we are doing it slowly, but we could do it a lot quicker. Describe the main beliefs that are common to every faith system. The main, what are the main beliefs that are common to every faith system? I think belief in the goodness of God and that we have a sacred part of ourselves which we can reclaim. What is the most important quality humans possess? What is the most important quality that humans possess? <laughs> We have in us a divine spark that you can see it, it's a light that shines in the human being. It is our direct access to truth, our direct access to God. And the purpose of all the spiritual practices that exist are to awaken that spark, to give it life, to give it energy so that it can transform you. And one of the energies that comes from that spark is love and you learn to work with it. Again, part of spiritual practice is learning to work with this energy you have within you so it can benefit your environment and really the world. It is a, this spark is exceedingly beautiful if you see it within a human being. It is, it is like a sun that is shining and every human being has it. It is the divine consciousness that is given to humanity as a gift. It is if it is used correctly, it can, it can incarnate the will of God. It is very, very beautiful. Human beings, when you see them as they really are, are unbelievably beautiful. They are, we are made of light. Yes, we have a lot of denseness, a lot of darkness in us, but our real essence is light. Somewhere you see a human being, and what is amazing is when a human being turns towards God, the light in them increases tenfold, increases a hundredfold. And they start to radiate in space and they start to give off light. And that is why a spiritually evolved human being helps the environment and connects also inwardly with other people who are spiritually evolved. There is, it is very, very beautiful. Describe the circumstances under which the world as we know it will come to an end. What are the circumstances that the world as we know it will come to an end? The world as we know it has already come to an end. Um, <laughs> you see again, as a mystic, you see how things change first in the inner. There is a law that everything that happens in life first constellates on the inner planes. For example, this movie you are doing first constellated as an idea inwardly. It was given to you as an idea. It came from somewhere within. And then slowly it comes into the outer world and you have a camera and you go around and meet people. And if you do mystical practices, you begin to see how things come into being. And 
the world as we know it inwardly has already ended it is already over this is the I think somebody once said it's like it's like the last dance on the ship of the Titanic on the Titanic it's like the last dance on the Titanic it is already over there is a whole other e level of evolution which I call evolution of oneness or global awareness not just I don't just call it myself many many people see it and it is already setting the scenes for the next level of human evolution and to me one of the most interesting things is the internet because the internet is a direct example of how oneness works and how it is incredibly efficient and it is everywhere at the same time and anybody well anybody who has a computer can have access to it and it was just given to humanity and it it is it works and so this the world as we know it has somewhere already ended but it is our work the work of you who are making this film the work of the people who are watching the film to bring this next level of evolution into being because it needs human beings who can see beyond the debris of the civilization that is around us if you look around with open eyes you see the debris of a dying or dead civilization why because there is no meaning what is it that gives life to any culture is meaning and without meaning and meaning does not mean to have a bigger car or a bigger house because human beings are made in the image of God we are divine we are spinning organisms of light and love and it is the spiritual always if you look back throughout all the cultures it's always the spiritual that gives meaning to people and it is our work to bring this next level of evolution into into form it does not yet it does not yet have any form um, if I may go off this now, I want to understand this still. Um, so we're right now in a transformation? Yes, a very, very, very major transformation. It's not just, people think this is just the end of a 2,000 year cycle. It is actually the end of a 100,000 year cycle. It is a very major transformation. And do we have any idea how long this transformation is? 100 years, 1,000 years? No, no, no. The next 20 or 30 years will determine how the next 1,000 years evolves. That is why it is so crucial. That is why so many people are being drawn from all walks of life to work on this transformation. And it is very interesting because I think America, because it is the most powerful country in the world at this moment, has a spiritual responsibility it has not yet fully acknowledged. It doesn't just, just have a financial, global responsibility, but because of that it has a spiritual responsibility and this is not yet it has not yet taken up that responsibility see the change will happen we are, the last civilization is already over it doesn't work anymore I mean you, to have a civilization that destroys the planet is a joke it means it isn't working anymore it means it's over but it can if the next civilization which is being born which is embryonic which is coming into being it is already here but not yet visible which has to do with oneness it can function on many different levels it can come into being on many different levels it can the highest is when the heart of the world awakens and the whole of humanity remembers God that will be a tremendous step it will be I have seen in, in meditation I have seen what that could be for humanity it's unbelievably beautiful it is a quality of harmony and togetherness and many of the problems which confront our world will cease to exist because we will work together quite differently from a place of oneness from a place of understanding rather than from a place of discord and then there are certain organic and very very deep changes that are happening you see it is difficult to describe because the real changes happen on the inner for example in a human being when the Sufis say when the heart wakes up when the when the organ of higher consciousness that belongs in the human being when the heart wakes up you are a totally different person your perspective on life changes you behave totally differently your values change you have experiences of bliss of happiness of oneness of merging that for most people are totally inaccessible and 
there is a possibility that the whole world could transform in that way, that something in the organic structure of the world, because the world is not just a physical blob floating through space, just as a human being is not just a physical entity. The world, like a human being, is a multi-dimensional living organism. It, it exists on many, many levels, and it also has a heart. It's called the soul of the world, anima mundi. It is, is the ancient alchemical expression, because the alchemists understood this process of transformation. And when that starts to wake up, and this is a possibility for the present time, this awakening of the soul of the world, then I say then magic will return to life. Then things will happen we can't even imagine because because that is the nature of, of creation. Creation is incredibly magical, incredibly beautiful and, and things happen that you couldn't even imagine because it's miraculous, because it belongs to God. Unfortunately we have treated the world like we treat ourselves as if we, it doesn't belong to God. So we deny <coughs> this whole magical dimension of life this whole miraculous dimension of life. And when is war justifiable? There is a very interesting misunderstanding, well it's not misunderstanding, but which is in this expression jihad. Jihad is the holy war. It is said there is the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. And the greater jihad is the war against the nafs, one's own lower self. And anybody who embarks upon any serious spiritual quest has to conquer their lower nature for example, their power drive, their lust, all of those qualities. And you have to fight it, because it doesn't just lie down and, 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 and give itself up. You don't just suddenly transform the power drive into loving-kindness. You have to fight it. And you, often it is a very, very painful process. It is, it is sometimes like a fight to the death. And so the mystic, the one on the spiritual quest, you see, this is why I feel that spiritually people who have have some spiritual understanding have so much to give back to humanity until now they have been much isolated within their own spiritual practice but they have a depth of understanding that is vitally important we understand how we have to fight our lower nature and sometimes that also has to be done on the world stage when evil is being committed when there are acts of terrorism, then you have to stand up and fight. And sometimes it is one's duty to fight. And sometimes it's one's duty to pray. And it is discrimination to know when to pray and when to fight. Define true love. Define true love. Oh, that's a good one. How to define true love. that wants nothing for itself, that is totally and completely free. Most people have no idea of what true love is because they always want something. They associate love with their emotional and personal needs, which is very understandable because probably not many of us were totally loved as children. We were caught in patterns of codependency in our parents' dynamics. But, well, the Sufis have a say, saying that once you have take just one sip of the wine of love. You are lost forever because it is completely different than anything you can expect. I remember for myself the, the first time I experienced that. I was sitting in meditation. I was 25. And it was as if a butterfly touched, a butterfly's wings touched the edge of my heart. And in that moment I was given everything I ever wanted. I was loved completely. Every cell of the body was loved. My heart was singing with love. It was, I couldn't believe there was anything more one could ever be given. It was complete. It was total. It was pure. That's why the Sufis call God the Beloved, because for Sufis the relationship with God is of lover and beloved. And we are loved so much. Actually, what is very interesting is every cell of creation is loved. You can have mystical experiences in which you see that. It is loved completely because the whole fabric of life, the whole fabric of creation is love. Love is this beautiful substance that comes from the inner planes. It is part of the 
It is part of God, I suppose, for most people, but everything is God. But this love comes into life and everything is nourished by love. It is otherwise, they say it's love that makes the world go round. It is actually true. If that note of love was missing, the, the world would fall apart. It's actually, and part of a spiritual journey is to go to experience this pure love. I always say it is like the difference between what most people call love and this love is like the difference of a glass of beer to a hundred percent proof alcohol. This love, true love, pure love, is incredibly intoxicating. It destroys your mind because in that dimension of love all your notions of yourself and your world are dissolved because it is just completely different. It is absolute and it is there. What amazes me, it is, it is present in everything in life because everything in life is made of love and we don't have direct access to it. It's one of the, I don't like to say jokes because it might be it's rather a painful joke, but it is one of the, the Sufis call it the veils of the beloved, the way he hides himself from us in, in his creation and part of the, the journey of the mystic is to uncover those veils and to find what is real. And when you find what is real and your heart starts to sing, you become a drunkard. The Sufis talk about the tavern of ruin because you are just drunk in love. You are a mystic, you are drunk and in love and you don't care anything for anything anymore because you have been given everything you want. And what are we all so afraid of? What are we all so afraid of? Oh, we are afraid of our shadows. We are afraid of the darkness inside of us. And so we project it outside and we have to go and fight these monsters that we project it onto outside. We are afraid of the dark. We are like children. And again, part of the mystical journey is to face that darkness. This is also the, you need the sword of your own aspiration to go into the darkness inside of yourself and to face that darkness. And then you discover that it isn't quite as dark after all and the fears that you had, things change. And then you begin to discover the light that is hidden in the darkness. This is one of the great alchemical secrets. This is one of the great secrets of human transformation, that you go into the darkness and it is terrifying at first, and, and then you discover this light of your own divine nature that is hidden in the darkness. It is called the pearl of great price that is at the bottom of the ocean. It is in the depths of darkness. There is something so beautiful. But most people are afraid of it because there is a price to pay to confront your own fears, your own anxieties, and to, to go deep within yourself. It is much easier to project it and to have enemies outside or people you dislike. Or, then you can project your problems and it's somebody else's fault. For the mystic, it is always us. And if you have the world's attention for one minute, I would say that it is time for the world to remember that it belongs to God and that there are in the world helpers of God. In the Sufis we call them the friends of God who look after the spiritual well-being of the world. And they have been helping humanity more than humanity is aware. They have been working to create a container for the next level of evolution of humanity. You can see it in meditation. It is a web of light around the world. It, has been, it is incredibly beautiful and it is time for us who are here in this world to work together with those helpers with, which, is, which is our own spiritual heritage and to help the world remember that it belongs to God. We cannot save the world except through the intercession of the divine. It is too far gone, the situation is too disastrous. All the, well -meaning all the well-meaning people in the world will not be able to help it. But the divine can because it belongs to God. If you were granted one wish, what would it be? That people stopped wasting their time and woke up 
to what they are here to do and what life is really about because it is such an extraordinary thing life and we only have a few years you know we are only in this world for maybe 60, 70, 80 years and there is so much to do there is so much light to bring into the world there are so much wonderful things to do and people waste their time and it is very very sad because they never have that time again and a lifetime that is wasted, that is, is lost. And a bit of divine remembrance, a bit of God, didn't come alive as it could have come alive. What keeps most people from living to their full potential? What keeps most people living to their full potential? Fear. Fear. It is... It stops them stepping into the light of their own self. It is this lovely saying that people are not so much afraid of the darkness as of their light, of their own power, of their own potential, because then you have to become a responsible adult. And most people prefer to be children and to blame somebody else. But it is never anybody else's fault. Once you take full responsibility for your life, it is your destiny. It is your life. Nobody else can live it for you. Nobody else can ring that particular note. You see, every human being has their own unique note to play in the symphony of life. And when it is played, then it makes the most beautiful contribution that nobody else can make. Because each human being is unique. Each human being is a unique creation of the divine. And it is sad when people, for some reason or other, decide not to play that note to stay in their fears, in their anxieties, in their pettiness, in their... and then a lifetime is wasted. Discuss the most critical role a parent can play by shaping a child's development. What is the most crucial role a parent can play in shaping their child's development? Loving them. That's all you need, just to love. You see, I am a parent and I know we make mistakes. I always say the great art of being a parent is knowing you are going to fail because you are going to make mistakes. But if you love, there is in the love a, a substance that speaks to the soul of the child. That So the soul of the child knows that it is accepted, that it is accepted for itself, not for what the parent wants it to be. And love somehow goes right through all the barriers and speaks to the essence and and then the child can go out into life and do stand on its own feet because it knows it is loved and once you know you are loved nothing else really matters on the surface things matter but you have that foundation you know you are loved what is wisdom and how do you gain it what is wisdom and how do you gain it oh <laughs> <laughs> um, it is different. If you are a mystic, you are given it. Because if you are a mystic, you become totally empty and you are given whatever you need. For example, there is a plane in which all the knowledge is. And you can go there. You can get whatever you need. So as a mystic, we are trained to be empty. We are trained to, to, be, to be empty. And so something that needs can get reflected into it. For most people, of course, that is inaccessible. So wisdom is the knowledge they gain through life experience. And this is very valuable. And, um, you know, you learn, you learn how to be with people. You learn whatever individual people learns. But for the mystic, it's different. You see, I said before that for the, the mystic, maybe I should explain, there is a difference, this is not generally understood, there is a difference between spiritual life and mystical life. Spiritual life, you aspire to something. You want to get close to God, you want to give a good, lead, lead a good life, you want to have, have, make a connection to your spiritual nature, and you can evolve, you can develop higher states of consciousness. A mystic wants nothing. We aspire to be completely empty, to be used by God for His purpose. We don't even want heaven or anything like that. 
we, we aspire to be empty and so we are used. I do not ask to see, I do not ask to know, I ask only to be used. That is one of the prayers of the mystic. And so we know nothing but we are given what we need. It's very beautiful how it happens. It just, you need to know something, it's suddenly just there in the mind. It is, comes from somewhere else. Like an intuition. For most people, their access to this level is through intuition. Suddenly you know something you didn't know before. And it's just there in your mind. You don't know where it comes from. And for the mystic, this is our state of being. Yes, we learn practical skills, how to drive a car, how to... But from a spiritual point of view, the real wisdom comes from somewhere else. It comes from the Beloved, comes from this plane where all the knowledge is. You can go there in meditation. Everything you need to know is there. All the knowledge of the past, all the knowledge of the future. It's just there. And you have access to it, and you use it where you need to use it. Or where you're, you're allowed to use it, because when you have access to that level of knowledge, you there are very strict laws about how you're allowed to use it because you can know somebody's future but you don't want to tell them their future because it would interfere with their journey through life. Does, um, do all souls have the possibility of being a mystic? No. Do all souls have the possibility of being a mystic? Absolutely not. There is a, a nice expression, mystics are born, they are not made. You see, you have to be a little bit crazy to be a mystic. To give up everything in your life, everything that people consider precious, even your beliefs, there comes a time when even your beliefs have to go. And nobody would do that in their right mind. So you have to have this substance in you that belongs to the soul. You bring, with it, you bring it with you into life. And it starts to make you a little bit crazy. And then this world, as you know it starts to dissolve. It no longer becomes real. And then it's time you find, find a teacher to help you through this process. The, because it's very dangerous, because you can go crazy. Because nothing that seems to be real is real anymore. Because you have to become transformed so you can be used by the Beloved for the sake of the Beloved, not for your own sake. That is the difference. What is heaven and how do we get there? What is heaven and how we get there? Heaven is a complete waste of time. Um, um, there's a lovely Sufi mystic called Rabia. She was a great Sufi mystic. And she said, Give the rewards of this world to your enemies. Give the rewards of the world to come to your friends. Thou art enough for me. Heaven is a state. It is a plane of, ex of that you can go after you die for a while because nothing is permanent. And it is very peaceful. It is very tranquil. And it gets a bit boring because nothing happens, you know? Nothing happens, and there is so much to do. Even, you know, after you die, there is a lot to do, too, but it isn't generally known, you know? There are so many dimensions of reality. Once you leave this body, you go into another body, you get a body made of light, and you work in other planes, and there are so many interesting things going on. This world is really rather dense, but somehow people have created this idea of heaven, and... I guess it. I, I understand why, because for most people this life is very hard work. And they want to have an idea of somewhere where they can go where it is peaceful and tranquil. And yes, if you do good works and you are a good person, you can get taken somewhere like that for a while. It doesn't last. What is prayer and what is its purpose? What is prayer? Hmm. What is prayer? Prayer is being with God. Prayer is... It begins, I think, prayer is a sort of private communion with God. When you can turn away from the world and 
sit alone with God and open your heart to God and pray to God, well, however God is for you. Later, of course, for the mystic it becomes a continual state. You pray all the time. It is actually your heart is in a continual state of prayer and praise of God. It is a recognition that he is God, that there is the divine is present in every moment, in every breath you breathe, because it is so wonderful to be with God, and you want to be with God all the time. And when you are with God, you automatically bow down and praise him. I mean, not physically, but something in the human being is just awake with the wonder of God. And so really for the mystic, it is, there comes a time, well, they say when the heart is awake, and then you pray continually, all the time, 24 hours a day, and it is, it gives meaning to life, because it is your remembrance of God, your remembrance of that extraordinary being, greater than any being, this quality, this energy, this power, call it what you will. The Sufi says, in the name of he who has no name, but who appears by whatever name you call him. And you want to you speak to him all the time somewhere you are always in communion with god you are always and if you are not speaking to him you are you are listening to him there's a lovely story i think it was a great sufi mystic al halaj who was asked who, who said you know when why does god not answer your prayers it is because he is listening to you sometimes he just likes to hear you ask him things so he doesn't answer right away because he likes to hear you talking to him, to asking to him, because there is nothing sweeter from God, for God than the human being whose heart looks towards God and says, please, beloved, help me. Please, beloved, help me. It is, I think it is the, the saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he said, the Prophet loved three things perfume and beautiful women and the shining of eyes in prayer. You know, when a human being prays, there is a light in their eyes. It is so beautiful. Then you see the divine in the human being and, ah, then suddenly you say, that is what we are here for. Because the whole human being lights up. And when you see what a human being is, when they are a light, then, then it is like a miracle. We are here to praise God. That is really the one of the deep reasons of our existence, just to praise God. What is religion and is current religion serving its purpose? I'm not answering that. <laughs> I'm a mystic. <laughs> How does one obtain true peace? How does one obtain true peace? Oh, it's very, very simple. Peace is the essence of the soul. The sheath of the soul is bliss, Anandamaya Kosha, and the substance of the soul is peace. It is called the peace that path is understanding because it has nothing to do with outer situations and you achieve it through spiritual practice and meditation. You go to that place in the soul where there is peace and once you have access to that, it is always with you. It is also traditionally the gift of a great teacher to his disciples. Apparently Christ gave it to his disciples. It is the gift of peace and it is given. But it is really the substance of the soul. What is the highest duty a person owes to the world? Service to God. The highest duty a person owes to the world is service to God, without question. That is what we are here for. And he has a beautiful title for the Sufis which is the servant of his servants. It is. We are here to serve God or to praise God. It is the same. You see, the difficulty is, is when you separate the world from God. To me that is one of the great, I don't say tragedies, because obviously it was meant to happen, but this patriarchal era that has come to an end, it banished God to heaven. And so we were left in this world without God. And, but, Again, the mystic, we experience things. We don't read about them, we don't talk about them. We go in meditation and we experience them. And once you experience how this world is divine, everything in this world is God. You are God, I am God, the trees are God, the sunshine is God, everything is God. 
And so our, our duty in this world is to be of service to God, which means to be of service to life, which means to be of service to the oneness, which means to live our destiny, because it is all the same. And, and then there is so much joy, because once you do what you come here to do, the soul wakes up, it starts to sing, it sings this extraordinary song of praise to God, which is your song, which is your offering to life. And the plants respond, and life responds, and people respond, and the bus arrives on time, and it works. Because it's life, because it's God, because there is no difference. There never was any difference. It was a big misunderstanding. Yes, humanity had to realize the transcendent aspect of the divine, because in the matriarchal consciousness 3,000 years ago, there was no transcendent God. And so there is an aspect of, the, of God, the Sufis say, beyond even our idea of the beyond. But that didn't mean that we should banish God from the earth, because whose earth is it? What else is there? Everything is God. What stands in the way of world peace? What stands in the way of, the way of world peace? That is a very, very difficult question. A big misunderstanding that we are here for ourselves. That humanity is here to survive. Yes, we have a very deep survival instinct. But interestingly, we bring with us two instincts into incarnation. Everything else is added afterwards. One is the will to survive, and the other is the will to praise God. It is imprinted into the soul. It is part of the genetic imprint of the soul. Everything else, culture, civilization, everything else comes after that. And somehow we have focused on the will to survive, and we have forgotten the will to praise. And if we, if you praise God, you automatically understand how everything is one. And once you step into that sphere, then things start to flow differently. This has to, again to do with the next level of evolution of humanity. Once you see how everything is one, the energy flows differently. For example, in, in Africa, so much of the starvation comes from war, not lack of food. Because people fight, they destroy everything. And if you are intelligent, if you are awake, and if you see this oneness that belongs to all of life, then there is no need anymore. It is actually very scientific. It is not, it is not difficult. What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? It is what is the meaning of life to you. Because for me it is different to you. Because each of us is unique, each of us is different, each of us has a unique note to play. Carl Jung he said, find the meaning and make the meaning your goal. Just like Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. It's exactly the same thing. And so, the meaning of life for me is different to the meaning of life to you. And there is no point in you trying to follow my meaning or me trying to follow your meaning. Because we are each unique. We are a unique creation. A, a butterfly doesn't try to become a tree. And you have a unique contribution to life which you are beginning to make now and I have a totally different contribution to life and they are in a strange way coming together at this moment of time and there is another meaning at this moment of time through your meaning and my meaning coming together something else is present something else comes into existence for just a moment and when people this is actually quite esoteric but when people who live their meaning meet each other a connection is made outside of space and outside of time that has a very lasting effect. It is like, becomes part of this bigger network, this bigger connection of light that gives meaning to the whole of life in where, where your meaning and my meaning for a moment intersect. And then we are outside of space, outside of time, and we are working together in a totally different way that, is, that affects not just you or me, but the whole. And that is very meaningful. <laughs> okay. um, despite all of our apparent differences amongst people, the theme of this project is we are all one. What are your thoughts on that? Despite all our apparent differences, we are all one. Of course we are all one. This is the most basic fundamental principle to life. We are all one. The mystic knows it because we experience it. It isn't just an idea. You have mystical experiences in which you experience how everything is one, how every leaf on, on the tree and the sky 
and everything is one and you see how people are one and you see that in that oneness their individuality is beautifully expressed it, the oneness does not deny their individuality oneness and individuality directly complement each other and in oneness the individual individuality of every person is respected the uniqueness of everybody is respected and their contribution to life has a place in oneness and oneness is the next step of evolution of humanity without a doubt it is the awareness of oneness the consciousness of oneness the energy of oneness is what is being given to humanity and you can see this on the as global consciousness but that is just an aspect of oneness it is a totally different energy which the mystic knows but is now being given to humanity as a whole and it is a fundamental step in, in, in humanity's evolution and how we work with it will depend upon the future of humanity. I believe there is enough to go around in the world. I believe in, in, in oneness and if you believe in oneness there must be enough for everybody. Why do some people have more than others? Because people are greedy, because they want more than what belongs to them, because we haven't yet evolved as a culture into this new perspective, this new understanding of oneness which as far as I understand is the next step of he human evolution and there is we have the technology and to give everybody what they need. There is enough food in the world for everybody. But it needs a transition beyond a certain grasping greed and uh, desire for power to take this step into a global unity in which there will be enough for everybody and a whole level of suffering will cease to exist for humanity. What would happen if everyone in the world truly learned to love their enemies? I don't think it's possible because in this world of duality nothing is perfect, nothing is pure, it is part of our dynamic of life. Jung, Carl Jung, the great philosopher, psychologist, he said somewhere you should never take somebody's problems away from them because it's through their problems that they grow, it is through this friction of light and dark that we grow. It would be a totally different species if we all loved each other because the conflicts of life are part of our evolution. It is, you grow through the conflicts with your parents. In our Sufi practice, we aspire to die before we die, to reconnect with that bright light, that uh, the higher self, while we're still in the physical body. And that's one of the central aspects of our spiritual practice, which, as I say, is encapsulated by the, the phrase, to die before you die. Why is there suffering and poverty in the world? Why is there suffering and poverty in the world? That's one of those big unanswerable questions. Because human beings are ignorant, because they have forgotten their divine nature, because they don't help each other, because they fight against each other, there are many, many reasons why human beings have to suffer. From a spiritual point of view, you see, and maybe I should explain that if you look at things from a spiritual point of view, it's quite different to if you look at it from a worldly point of view. And if you look at it from a spiritual point of view, anyone who has begun the spiritual journey knows that suffering is a process of purification, where we clean out the, the debris that we have accumulated inside of us, the denseness, the, the darkness within the psyche. And that suffering, that purification, the, the Sufis call it polishing the mirror of the heart until one day the mirror is so polished that it reflects the divine light of God through the heart into the world and that is part of our spiritual practice. And I firmly Uh, your name, background, a little bit about yourself. Okay, my, my name is Llewellyn Vaughan Lee. I was born in England in 1953. 
I had a sort of English middle class upbringing and then when I was 19 I met a Sufi teacher called Arina Tweedy who had uh, studied in India under a Sufi master and I stayed with her for many 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 years and then in 12 years ago I was sent to America to make a Sufi center in California and have continued her work of this particular Sufi tradition which is known as the Naqshbandi Sufi tradition we're known as the silent Sufis because we practice a silent meditation and our tradition goes back to the 13th 14th century in the Middle East how's that good. yeah Volume good. Everything's great. All right. Describe what happens to a person after they die. <laughs> Describe what happens to a person after they die. It depends on the evolution of the soul. Um, most peoples, they have these near-death experiences. They go through a tunnel of light. They go through a tunnel and they meet a, a bright light at the end of the tunnel. That bright light is actually their higher self or the soul, which people reconnect with after they die, after you leave the physical body, after you leave the physical body. And our prac how if you see how our culture looks in the inner world, you see this dark cloud of forgetfulness that covers the world. There is also the desecration is also phenomenal. We have desecrated almost everything we regard as sacred. We we have destroyed it. And so we have cut ourselves off from the source which nourishes us. If you don't have physical food, your body starves. If you don't have spiritual food, your soul starves. And if the soul starves, the meaning goes out of life. And if the meaning goes out of life, you get, you get depressed. And we have forgotten. To me, one of the great tragedies is not just that we have forgotten as a culture. We have, for example, forgotten that the world belongs to God. That is the most basic, fundamental reality that exists. The world belongs to God. We have not only forgotten the world belongs to God, we have forgotten that we have forgotten. It is such a dim, distant memory of a time when everything was sacred. It isn't actually, historically, it's not so long ago. Two or three thousand years ago, everything was sacred. Now what is sacred? Hardly anything. And so, of course, we are depressed because we are deprived of that which gives meaning and joy to life. It is very, very simple. You see, my teacher, she said, mystics teach simple things, but those simple things change people's lives. Why? Because God is a simple essence. The more you go on in meditation, the more you go on in your spiritual practice, you go back to the essence, you, go, you discover yourself. And... Yes, there is a level of evolution where you realize the love that is everywhere. This is one of the basic mystical experiences that many, many people on the path have. And you see that everything is made of love. There is nothing other than love. And then, once you have reached that level, you do love everybody because, as the Sufi says, wheresoever you turn, there is the face of God. And when I look at you, I don't just see you, I also see the divine. I see the divine that is in you just as it is in me. And then I can't help but love you. But that is a, a, a long way for most people to travel. And so most people are caught in this dynamic of conflict, of light and dark, which is part of the fabric of their life. If we lived in a perfect world, it wouldn't be here. But in perfection, there is no evolution because everything just is. Why are so many people depressed? Why are so many? Because they have forgotten God. Very, very simple. We live in a culture of forgetfulness. I do a lot of meditation. I've been meditating for, oh, since I was 16, for 35 years, 34 years. And you can see inwardly, because this physical world is not the only world there is. And once you do much meditation, you begin to see somewhere else. You begin to see what the Sufis call or what is known as the inner planes, what is beyond the physical. There are many different planes of creation. And if you look in the inner world, 